Dieter Rams is one of the most influential designers to ever live. Even if you don't know who he is, you probably use the products that were inspired by his thinking every single day. He crafted the 10 principles for good design, which are kind of like the design Bible. But I can't help but wonder, is our blind commitment to these principles holding us back from designing a better future? For example, this iPhone. It's sleek, it's simple. It's supposedly a product of Dieter Rahm's less but better design philosophy. But throughout this video, you'll see that less is not always better, and the mantra is rooted in 20th century thinking. It's not the answer to the sustainable design problems we're facing today. We'll go even deeper though. Beyond Rahm's celebrated 10 principles, there is a key ingredient that was revolutionary for his time, but no one seems to talk about. Now, before you all take out your pitchforks and torches convinced that I'm desecrating the design Bible, it's important to note that Rams himself never wanted these principles to be permanent. They were always meant to be updated. So let's get to it. So the first principle I want to talk about is good design is honest. On the surface, this seems like a great principle. I mean, who can argue with honesty? But I think this runs counter to what a designer fundamentally does on many levels. If we use Dieter's definition of honesty, I could make a very strong argument that good designers are about as honest as used car salesmen. Hot dog, a sale! In fact, we're probably even worse, because at least with a used car salesman, you know exactly what to expect. With designers, their influence is so subtle that it often goes by undetected. Detected. Honesty is just not the first word I'd use when describing good design. So take this pair of sunglasses as an example. It covers half your face, and the right pair that's designed well can accentuate your attractive features while downplaying your less flattering ones. A big part of design is about focusing people's attention on positive things and away from negative things. It's like an Instagram filter, but for products. Dieter Rump's principle of honest design probably has its roots in the Bauhaus concept of truth to materials. Essentially, truth to materials promotes authenticity, arguing that you should never make one material look like another. But my question is, why not? Keeping up with the eyewear theme, let's look at the glasses frames that Dieter Rams is wearing. They're probably made from cellulose acetate. Acetate is meant to mimic the coloration you'd see on tortoise shell frames from the early 20th century. The only way to get this material honestly is to kill a hawksbill turtle, which is a critically endangered species, and then turn its shell into a pair of eyewear frames. But it's been illegal to use tortoise shell as a material in products since like 1977. So are Dieter Rams glasses dishonest because they're trying to make cellulose acetate look like tortoise shell. I mean, I guess under the Bauhaus definition, yeah, but I don't have a problem with it, and Dieter doesn't seem to either. Hundreds of thousands of fake tortoise shell frames are made from cellulose acetate every single year. It's a beautiful pattern, and if you tried to harvest it the honest way, you'd have to hunt and kill turtles to the point of extinction. It's the same thing with any design, even mundane things like this external hard drive. It's designed to appear thinner than it actually is by breaking up the surfaces into different materials and textures. Is that dishonest? I mean, I don't think so. A big part of design is about elevating the perceived value of a product. Take a look at this $50 calculator designed by Rams and his team. Everything is harmoniously spaced. The glossy dome-shaped buttons reflect light like little shiny jelly beans. The strategic color accents make the most important buttons pop. Everything about this design just screams balance, precision, and clarity. And that's the exact emotional response you want to have when you look at a calculator. It's a tool for precise calculation. And that's why this calculator retails for $50, but this Staples calculator is $4. I mean, sure, the brown calculator is probably functionally better because of its good design. It's probably made a little bit better, but it's not 10 times better. You're paying 10 times more for the emotional response that this object creates in you. This isn't just a calculator anymore, either. It's a symbol of purity and order. Plus, the brown calculator is a design icon, which is also totally emotional and sentimental. None of that value is grounded in any kind of objective truth. It's still just a plastic calculator. So is the design dishonest in how it creates meaning beyond the sum of its parts? Or is it dishonest with how expensive it is? I would say no, but according to the way that Dieter wrote this principle, you would think yes. But here's the thing. Dishonest or not, it's still a great design. As long as people value things beyond just their functional utility, this will always be the case. That's why I don't agree with the idea of good design being honest, at least as far as Rams defines it. If some of this sounds familiar, I actually made a video on this topic last year that was going viral, but a copyright claim brought it down. 
I do have many new insights on this topic though, so keep watching. If you could click the like button to help me out with the YouTube algorithm, I'd really, really appreciate it so that I can get this video back to where it was. It makes a really big difference in spreading this important message to young designers. But anyway, I haven't even gotten into the act of actually selling your ideas in a corporate setting as a designer. There's an old saying in the design world that paper lies like hell. Designers use all sorts of visual trickery like beautiful sketches and renders to sell their ideas. A great designer is a great sale. It's just that designers convince you with pictures and prototypes, whereas traditional salesmen convince you with words. If you walk into any design studio and look at any of the concepts pinned up on the wall, you'll naturally gravitate towards the ideas that are drawn or rendered the best. You can hide all sorts of design flaws with a well-presented concept sketch. You can distort the proportions, you can use flattering lighting in your renders, or place your physical prototype on a pedestal to make it seem more valuable. I just find the good design is honest principle to not really be in line with my experience. We're looking for captivating and emotional stories imbued in our products. We don't always want honesty. Sometimes we want enchantment. Before we get into the next section, I want to talk about Shaper 3D. Imagine the convenience of post-it notes and the sophistication of 3D CAD coming together in one software package. That's Shaper 3D. Plus, you can use it on your iPad. This comes in super handy when you're on the go and inspiration strikes, or you're in the middle of a client meeting and want to sketch up a quick, high-fidelity concept. If you're just starting to learn the basics of CAD and 3D printing, this is an amazing tool that has a far more accessible and intuitive user interface than any other 3D modeling tool that I've used. Using a stylus to draw is really where Shaper 3D stands out. Plus, it's a lot more affordable than other more expensive software CAD packages. It's just a great mobile tool for creating and showing 3D models on the go. Whether you're designing something as simple as a workbench or as complex as an engagement ring, Shaper 3D has you covered. It's a great tool for engineers, designers, architects, 3D printing hobbyists, and even students or recent design grads. Go click the link in the description to get 10% off Shaper 3D with the code DESIGNTHEORY10. Back to the video. The next principle is good design is as little design as possible. The classic less but better mantra is the crowning jewel of Rahm's principles, but it's probably one of the most commonly misinterpreted ones. First of all, it's led to an entire generation of designers losing their minds every time they see a rounded rectangle. <laughs> I mean, sure, this is great design work, but why does it look like they were all designed by Dieter Rams in 1959? If you really respect Dieter Rams as a designer, you would forge your own path just like he did. Secondly, many designers took this principle to mean, let's just strip everything down to the bone. We often see a surface level application of his principles resulting in products that may appear simple, but are anything but simple in terms of functionality, cost, or usability. Getting rid of essential usability features might make things visually simpler, but it often complicates the object's function. When a product loses too many of its controls, the remaining ones are left to pick up the slack. So you have two buttons that do like 10 things, holding down, tapping, performing a finger ritual dance. You You've traded intuitive interaction for a device that needs an instruction manual, or chairs that are too uncomfortable to actually sit in for more than 10 minutes, or computers that are missing headphone jacks or functional ports. The true purpose of minimalism was to ease user experience by limiting options, but instead it's mostly used as an aesthetic statement. So you end up with visual simplicity that's a functional nightmare. It's like telling someone to clean their room by shoving everything under the bed. Complex design doesn't always overcomplicate, it clarifies. Less isn't always Always more. Sometimes it's just less. There's also the ironic twist of manufacturing processes as it relates to minimalist products. The mission of the Bauhaus movement and the same spirit that Dieter Rahm subscribed to was all about making good products that were accessible to everyone. But then you've got Apple using manufacturing techniques that are exorbitantly intricate and expensive. The result is a design that's visually minimalist but financially out of reach for most people. In their pursuit of as little design as possible, they've ironically created products for as few people as possible. And then you've got Johnny Ives' $65,000 turntable. It's a blatant symbol of desire, an opulent statement piece, but that was never the point of the Bauhaus or minimalist movements. They're aimed to create simple, useful designs that are accessible to everyone. It was beauty born out of purpose and uncompromised by mass production, but somehow we've warped this ideology, focusing on the superficial aesthetic while neglecting the core principles. 
Now, I want to be very clear here. The problem here isn't about minimalist design or even the existence of luxury products. There's not even an inherent issue with merging these two elements. I've done it before too. The real problem here is with the unquestioning idolization of Dita Rams and his principles while not understanding their true meaning. There is sometimes a more practical reason why minimalist design is so expensive though. And it's not just because it's what's in style. It's also because execution for good minimalist design has to be perfect. It's the difference between simple and elegant versus boring and basic. Fewer elements means that every detail is under a spotlight. So ensuring these details are perfect can drive up production costs. In this way, the pursuit of minimalism can ironically lead to exclusivity rather than the intended goal of universal accessibility. A customer would never notice these little specific specific details, but it's a major reason why Apple products just subconsciously feel premium and Amazon Basics products feel kind of ordinary. Ironically, you can make an argument that Amazon Basics is more in line with Dita Rob's less but better philosophy than Apple is. This extends even to color, which is slowly disappearing from our world because of a push for more understated design. Now we're stuck with a bunch of lifeless, boring gray objects surrounding us everywhere we go. There's nothing wrong with minimalist design. It's just that it's not appropriate for every single product. So a lot of people have misinterpreted Rahm's principle of as little design as possible. That's not his fault. However, I do still think that the merit of the principle itself needs to be critiqued a little bit. Take a look at this computer mouse. It's a classic example of aesthetics over usability, and it's a problem. I mean, sure, this mouse looks really nice, but I had to use this mouse in high school, and I can't even begin to describe how uncomfortable it was to hold. Dieter Rahm says that he hates when beautification is the priority for design, and I agree with him in many cases, like with this computer mouse. But I think that a lot of times this as little design as possible idea is used as an excuse to make emotionless design that's cold and oversimplified and not in line with what the customer needs. Dita Ram sometimes criticizes the automotive industry for being overly focused on speed and emotion rather than functionality. He says that he hates the idea of aesthetic styling and decoration. I hate everything what is driven by fashion, especially the cars. They change their, their styling things every two years. Dieter wants people to be logical, rational actors, but nobody makes decisions that way, not even him. I mean, the guy drives a Porsche, not exactly the most sensible choice for a car. You can't just ignore the fact that people have visceral, emotional responses to certain products. I've watched hours of Dieter Rahm's footage when researching this video. Rahm's always seems happiest when he's talking about or driving his favorite cars. I know that might not seem like much here, but trust me, he's a really serious guy. He does not smile a lot. Cars are an emotional purchase. Most of them do not use as little design as possible. They're usually much more expressive, and Rahm's Porsche is definitely no exception. By the way, I'm not criticizing Rahm's for driving a nice car. I think it's great. I'm merely using it to point out that not all products should use as little design as possible. Usability is tied to aesthetics. The styling of a product matters. If nothing else, my design experience has taught me this. Even the most logical design without emotional resonance will fall flat. Form and function are one and the same. A product's appearance guides our interaction with it, and sometimes you need a little bit of the embellishment or flair. Another thing to consider is the value of decorative beauty purely for beauty's sake. Think about what a massive social and economic benefit it is to have beautiful architecture that's adorned with exuberant decorative cultural elements. Pretty much every new city skyline today looks the same. I know that Dieter never intended for this, but this is the dark side of minimalism. We express who we are and what we value through the products we use. All of these designs have so much personality and cultural heritage, and I think that's a beautiful thing that should be celebrated, not ignored. On the bright side, Gen Z is pushing more towards maximalism in design. Faced with dull interiors and a world filled with negativity, it seems like they're opting for this hyper-maximalist, vibrantly colored aesthetic as a counter-reaction. Plus, with the advent of artificial intelligence tools, it's simpler than ever to achieve a maximum aesthetic. And this is slowly making its way from images online to fashion and finally into physical product design. Obviously, whether it's minimalism, maximalism, or anything in between, it needs to be done with a deeper sense of purpose and meaning. Here's how I might revise this principle. Good design communicates what is necessary. It's just an idea, maybe it's a little bit vague, but feel free to leave a comment and we can talk about what you might replace this principle with. And on that note, feel free to subscribe, or don't, but you should, you should subscribe. I don't know, just subscribe. So the next principle is good design is environmentally friendly. 
No one wants to design products that are environmentally unfriendly, at least not on purpose. The whole idea of less but better from an environmental perspective seems logical, but this is actually a very antiquated 20th century line of thinking. Let's use fuel efficient cars as an example. I mean, sure, it's more efficient and doing more with less, but it's still burning fossil fuels. We're slowing down the harm, but the system itself is still harmful. This is the classic less but better strategy, also known as eco-efficiency. It's like applying a Band-Aid to a blister caused by poorly fitting shoes. Sure, the Band-Aid might help the pain for a little while, but the real problem is with the poorly fitting shoes. In the same way, eco-efficiency is the Band-Aid that fails to tackle the root cause. Our reliance on unsustainable resources. But there are ways to actually create positive impact. It's called eco-effectiveness, a term from the book Cradle to Cradle. It's not about doing less harm, it's about doing more good. Some companies are growing packaging materials and other products using mushrooms and natural substances. Instead of focusing on making less harmful products, they're making products that can be composted at the end of their life cycle, enriching the soil. Basically, less but better eco-efficiency is about doing less harm, whereas eco-effectiveness is about doing more good. It's about regenerative processes. Now, I know that Dieter Rams understands the environmental issues that we face today. We have serious infrastructure and transportation problems. It's also far easier said than done to completely change an existing corporate and social infrastructure. But the main point is that less but better is only treating the symptoms rather than the core disease itself, which is humanity's blind quest for ruthless growth at all costs. Let's get into good design as long lasting. I generally agree with Dieter's sentiments on this one, but like I said before, if a system is regenerative and not actually harmful to the environment, it's okay if it's disposable. Regarding the fashion comment, there is a legitimate human need for self-expression through fashion that will probably never go away. These shells were reshaped and used as jewelry, and they're about 150,000 years old. Self-expression in fashion is a deeply ingrained human need that's probably been around for as long as we have. Now, I do think that we consume too much. You don't need to buy a new phone every year. Disposable fast fashion is horrible. But doing away with something as integral as self-expression through the things that we use and wear is never gonna happen. Ultimately, Ultimately, people are going to buy what they want to buy. It's the designer's job to help them do it more responsibly. A potential amendment to this could be something like, good design is regenerative. Next up is good design is thorough down to the last detail. Rom specifically says that nothing should be arbitrary or left to chance, but I actually think that arbitrary chance is a big part of any creative process. In this clip, Dieter Rams is pruning the trees around his garden. He likens the gardening process to design, which is a beautiful metaphor. Gardening is organic and messy and imperfect. Like tending to a bonsai tree, you can nurture it, situate it in good sunlight, prune it, but you can't control every leaf's shape or each branch branch's exact trajectory. You can't force it to your will. You have to let it flow naturally. And design mirrors this process. It's a collaborative effort where each person on the team brings their own perspective to the project. The best thing you can do is guide the process in the right direction and trust that the other people you're working with have the end user's best interest at heart. You can't really control it. Sometimes technology makes it impossible to be too thorough anyway, especially with generative design tools. You write software algorithms that can often have a life of their own. Same thing with a lot of modern AI tools. Dita Rams could not have possibly anticipated this when he wrote these principles, but that's exactly why they need updating. But even without advanced tech, there are also so many instances where I'm sketching something and accidentally draw a line in the wrong spot. And then I realize, oh, wait a minute, that actually might work better than what I originally had in mind. A lot of times these happy accidents end up becoming the final product. Good design is unobtrusive. I actually agree with Dieter in regards to most tools. Tools usually should act as an extension of the user's body. They shouldn't get in the way. But the thing is that most products are not strictly tools. I can think of dozens of successful products that are very obtrusive and very decorative. The PS5 is one immediately that comes to mind. The design really stands out and is very imposing. I know lots of you will disagree with me, but I would still consider it an appropriate design for its use case. High heeled shoes are another great example of a very obtrusive design that people still choose to wear. That's also why there are so many different styles of shoes. People want to express themselves in different ways. Now, I'm betting you Dieter would say that these examples aren't good design. They're just stylistic fashion. But like I said earlier in the video, if you care about usability, you care about styling and the way that a product makes someone feel. That directly impacts its function. Let's move on to good design makes a product understandable. I think this is probably one of his best principles, but even still, I can think of several counterpoints. 
Take these watches by Nuka, for example. They're not really the most understandable way to read time, but the novel experience of learning how to read the watch is fun. You feel a sense of accomplishment as you master the tool over time. You especially see this with luxury watches that have all sorts of weird dials and extra features. Not everything needs to be about effectiveness. It's why we go fishing with a fishing rod rather than just electrocuting everything in the pond. It's like learning a musical instrument. Lots of things are specifically designed with a learning curve in mind because half the fun comes from navigating, learning, and mastering the product over time. Next, we have good design makes a product useful. You can't really argue that good design makes a product useful, but you can definitely argue about what useful means. The Juicy Salif is one of the most obvious examples of this. It's supposed to be a juicer, but it's pretty much completely useless for that purpose. You might say that its use is not to be a juicer at all, but instead its purpose is to strike up conversation. It fulfills a more abstract need of being a provocative object. It also fulfills the need of bringing conversations around design and usefulness into a more mainstream context. Or if we look at the Lamborghini Countach, most would say it's a great design if you're interested in going fast or maybe to inspire the next generation of sports cars. But if you're a soccer mom who needs to transport her kids and all of their gear to and from school, it's not a useful design at all. I don't think that this is a bad principle because who doesn't want useful products? But once again, useful could mean a lot of different things to different people. Next up is good design is innovative. I'll keep this one short. It's true most of the time. However, I don't think that all good design must be innovative. Many of Dieter's designs for Brown haven't changed that much over the last several decades, and they're still just as good as ever. Last but not least, good design is aesthetic. This one's fine, although maybe a little bit vague since my idea of aesthetic and Dieter's idea are clearly very different. Overall, I think that Dieter Rahm's principles are great as a starting point. They're excellent guiding principles if you're a young person just starting out in design. Rahm's actually created these principles for his students when he first started teaching. They were never meant to be these immutable truths. Another problem is that you can't make a prescriptive set of principles for all of the design industry. Every part of the industry is just so radically different. Dieter wrote these while working for a German electrical appliances company in the mid 20th century. The principles fit perfectly for that use case, but they don't really apply to a lot of other situations. It's kind of like how you hear those vague platitudes you see people writing about on LinkedIn or whatever. When creating a guiding set of principles, some of the most important things are making sure that they're simple, understandable and concrete. I think that Dieter's principles are simple and understandable, but they're not very concrete because of how broad they are. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that Dieter Rahms had an ace up his sleeve that catapulted him to superstar status. In my opinion, the real thing that made Dieter Rahms special is that he's a systems thinker and that f car. <laughs> We'll do that again. Dieter Rahm stood out above his peers because of how he focused on the way design can mold society to be more egalitarian and humane. That's why his products are so iconic. You can feel that grand vision subtly shining through his products. For Rahm's, it wasn't just about creating a shelving system or a toaster, but it was about envisioning an entire system around the way we live. I've championed this mindset in my design work, and I believe it's crucial to the future of design. But Rahm's beat me to the punch by half a century. I'm really surprised that this isn't discussed more often. Context changes, and Rahm's principles don't have to be our only guide. What we should borrow from Rahm's is his faith in design's potential to shape a brighter future. Like I said earlier, I made a similar video on this topic that was taken down. One person left an incredibly insightful comment, and I'm so glad that I saved it before it vanished into the digital ether forever. It wraps up Rahm's principles beautifully while adapting them for our changing world. Good design bows to the fundamental principles of life. It's never just about the product. It's about the all-encompassing system. It must respect all people, the designers, engineers, factory workers, end users, and of course, the most important user, Mother Earth. Damn, that's good. That is a great principle to live by. Big shout out to Liz Engel for this comment. If you wanna support this channel, consider joining me on Patreon. You'll get access to all sorts of cool things like working files for some of my personal projects, rough drafts of scripts that have a lot of additional information, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It also allows me to focus on topics that you and I wanna talk about rather than whatever will just get the most views. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you learned something and have a great day.